some of us actually listen to your preaching. So when I got off the floor, she said, I had this made for you because you said that there are none. So I was presented with a one-of-a-kind wall plaque that says, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you to, that one of your members perish than that your whole body be cast into hell, Matthew 5, 29. Now, if you remember my sermon when I said, you see all those, you know, blessed be the poor, the meek, they'll inherit, but you never see this on a wall plaque. I now have one. <laughs> How about that? So I want to thank Kimberly for making that so that I would have a one of a kind. Well, <coughs> let me spread my little mess out here and tell you that uh, I don't know that I enjoyed the dinners we would have on the third Wednesday or whatever, I think it's the third Wednesdays we have the dinners in there before we came in. I, I actually think the prayer time and the teaching time and the handouts, I, I just liked it on Wednesday nights. It's kind of a different environment. So we can get serious in here about this, this unbelievable book this, this morning we were reading in our devotions, and we read the, the book of Nahum, and uh, I'd encourage you to look at it. The entire book is about America and its fall that's coming. It is written to Nineveh back when Nahum wrote it, but he's writing to America. It even mentions that men have become nothing and that women are leaders, if you read the print in it, and all about what's going on in America right now as Nahum is predicting the fall of Nineveh and that around the world people will applaud when we fall. And the reason is that we're 20% of the population and we consume 80% of the resources on the planet and all the rest of the world will clap when Nineveh falls. Well, I don't know what you read or what you do. We're working through the minor prophets right now. And, you know, it's, it's not all, but there's a lot of gloom and doom in the minor prophets. And, and some of it's very curious. But I'm in a state in my life. I'm in a place in my life where the Bible has become so precious, so insightful, so promising that... When I read it, I am staggered by how deep it is, by how it's just not about what was being written by a prophet, but almost all of it goes from the garden to the garden. It goes from the tree of good and evil in Genesis to the tree of life in New Jerusalem. And everything is the book. Everything in the book is about what goes on between two trees. And our love for it, our love to study it and discover it and look at it and flip it over and read it that way and compare it to this passage. And today I was reading every passage in the Bible on marriage, every passage in the Bible on weddings, every passage in the Bible on wed, every passage in the Bible on male and female, and I can tell you, most all of them have to do with slaves and servants, not marriage. In my preparation for a sermon on marriage for our 50th on the 21st of May. I'm driven that way. I can't imagine not having read everything I could read in the Bible before I make an assumption about anything. Let me see what God say. What does his book say? Well... Let us begin our journey through those that need our prayers.
Join me, would you, as we hear my voice representing all of our prayers for the last time here on a Wednesday night. Some of these folks I don't know. Some of them I do know. But you know what I know them from? Reading their names week after week, month after month, and hearing the reports on this one's gotten better. What is it, dear? Angela Wilkerson is having surgery when? Okay. If that sounds like chicken scratchings, it is. I talked with a fella today whose wedding I did 30 years ago. And uh, their 30th anniversary is coming up next week. I take marrying people really, really serious. A couple here has come to me and asked me if I would do their wedding and I told them, yeah, but you have to sign a covenant and go to premarital counseling because someday I do not want to stand before God and have joined someone together that doesn't understand the absolute commitment. To me, it is the only vow we make as human beings. God vows to us that if we would surrender our lives to Jesus Christ and put our faith and trust in the completed work of the cross, his vow, his promise to us is he will never forsake us or leave us. The only place God is inviting us to make a vow is when we stand with one woman and one man before God and the people we know and we make a commitment for better or for worse, richer or poorer. Debbie didn't know how much poorer poor meant or to sickness, health. Anyway, I was very glad to talk to that young fella today. I call him young. Well, let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, we begin tonight knowing that there's not a name you're going to hear that you don't know. You don't know where their hearts are. That you don't know what their family is like, what their struggles are like, what their finances are like. You know them all. You know every need. You know every want. So we come to you lifting these names up. Not that you don't know them, but we want you to know we know these names and we ask for your intervention. We ask for your grace and kindness. We ask for your ministry and willingness to heal and help, calm. We lift up Diane Allred to you, Lord. Danetta Aldridge, battling an inoperable brain tumor. Jennifer Aldridge, Brenda Allison and Robbie Anderson. We have the Arrowwoods, Father. We have Joy with her shoulder issues and Terry with his liver and both Jimmy and Evelyn Arrowwood have cancer. Brandon Baker and Gene Barber. Sarah Barter and Melda Bennett. And Tommy Brewer, Belinda Bowman, Gladys Bowman. Rebecca Boyd, Lord, with both lung and heart issues. Kathy Brasfield, cancer, the heart and the liver. Lisa Brown. Barbara, Bridget's mom, who's still trying to find the right balance and the right doctors to find out what to do about her lungs and her breathing. Baby Bryson, well, I just pray that you continue to heal that child with cerebral palsy and what he's facing. <clears throat> Jane Bird, and cancer, the brain pan tonight. Jennifer Karen, bowel cancer. Lord, we lift up Isaiah Carter, that young man in the Army in Texas that had the wreck. I pray he would be on his feet and back. Jennifer Cosby, cancer. Terry Childress, heart attack. Wyatt Cobb with Mercer, just a young teenager. Dexter, Dexter Cook, we pray for Dexter. Rusty Cooper and Margie Cox, broker hip. Harold Curtis, Francis Dalton, heart surgery. Wilma Davis, Amy Dowdle with a thyroid. And Mike Duncan, pneumonia. Mary Faith, early knee surgery. 
Fanny Dover, colon cancer. Robert Gaddy having heart surgery. I believe I got another note there. No, it's <laughs> Janine and Dwayne Gibson. Lord, we pray that uh, uh, they would have patience as they deal with uh, Janine in a wheelchair in life as they have at Jan's. Uh, Dad, James, is having heart issues, Lord. We lift him up to you. Mitch Gillespie, stage four liver and pancreas cancer. Jack Googe with heart ablation. Tina Haney, Kelvin Hanner, triple bypass. Margaret Harris, uterine cancer. Sandy Harris, Lord, we just lift up her and Ernestine. Ernestine, <laughs> Ernest. Um, Ernest and uh, her battle with cancer, Lord. We just pray you can give, give, give good numbers on her blood counts, Lord. Noah Hayes, we pray for him. Kayla Higgins with heart issues and Becky Higgins with lymphoma. Amy Holland and Gina Holland. And Jennifer is quite ill as well. Another one of the sisters, Ronald Hollis, um, uh, that he would be uh, he'd fully recover. Father Andrew Jackson with his Crohn's disease, Barbara Jandu, lung tumors and uh, brain issues. Father Jenny Jared, right knee. I believe that that's one's having surgery. Landon Jones. He's 18, I understand he's improving. Addie and Kathy Kaler. Uh, Wayne Kaler had surgery Monday, we just thank you, that went well. Uh, Hammer Kaler, we lift up Sandy Cock. Vicki Kenyon, inoperable brain tumor, P P Perry Loing, Bridget Lewis, biopsy. We pray for that, Lord. Uh, we understand the scar tissue is cr creating a problem for her. Debbie Lewis, hospital with heart failure. I lift up John Lingefell, Lord, continue to strengthen his lungs and um, strengthen his body. Lord, help him with his back. Russell Lowry with his seizures. Carolyn Long, um, lungs, I believe she needs surgery. Marilyn McKinley, Harold and Donna and Helen and Jimmy McKinney. Kim Michaels, brain cancer. Becky uh, Miller and Roger Miller. Uh, Kenneth Moore. Lord, uh, we move to Suzanne Newton. We thank you, Lord, for her smile, her voice to sing, her love for worship. We pray for her cancer and full restoration and healing. Jean Nichols, Lord, at uh, John Hopkins with cancer. Naomi, Samantha's mom. Brittany uh, Pace, 20, uh, with the broke legs from an accident. Julie Padgett, ALS disease. Ronald Padgett, Seth Pardon, Sheila Parker. Brent Phillips, kidney failure. Tommy Poole with RSV blood infection. Joyce Petit, uh, uh, Kelly Pritchard, chemo. Um, Bonnie Putnam, Bill Riggs is in the hospital, Lord. Judy Robbins, leg and feet issues. Tracy Scott, Hannah Settermeyer, their seizures. Barbara Silver, Mary Shoemaker, Kenny Street, George Taylor, uh, Bobby Tessner, David Thomas, Betty Thomas, Larry Vaughn, and Billy Weaver. And we have Archie Williams and Sierra Williams, Tommy Wilson, uh, Sherry Winsett. Oh, Lord, I want to lift up... Uh, Bill Riggs, he's in the hospital Asheville with heart issues, and Angela Wilkinson, surgery on the 24th of this month. I uh, also want to lift up James Condry. Lord, he's had a CT scan, CT scan on his bladder, and there's issues to deal with. Uh, David Weaver and Kathy Wyatt at Autumn Care. McDowell Assisted Living. Lord, Linda has got a procedure on her knee. Mary Bailey. Uh, Isabella, dealing with the loss of her daughter. Macy's son Stetson is home, showing improvement. Mary is home, but not doing well. We pray for the staff and residents there. Lord, we want to move to those that have lost loved ones. There is a wound that cannot be seen on the outside, but the wound of a lost loved one is, uh, is a deep wound. So we come to you with families, the Bond family and the Bowman family and the Burroughs family, Cawthon and Camp and Cox and Cole family, Fox family and the Good family and the Hillsack Dagger family, uh, James family, Long and Lauren family, the Love family, the Morgan family, Owens B family, the Payne family, Raider family. Lord, we have the um, uh, Romine family and the Ross family, the Spencer family, the Woods and the Kilpatrick family, the Boyd and Huskins and Johnson, Michaels and Reese family. We want to pause to praise for the Glenwood Elementary School, the teachers, the jan uh, janitors, the staff people that are there, Lord, the bus drivers that bring them and take them. We pray for all of those that do counseling and care for those children. Lord, we pray for the children and future of this Glenwood community. 
We also want to lift up this church, Father, and its future. I pray for an outpouring of your spirit on this congregation, Lord. I pray for Ryan, that he would be exactly what you want him to be for this group. <coughs> I want to lift up America and all that we're facing. I want to lift up all of the things that are going on in our legal system, Lord. There, We're seeing names appear that we're curious about. We scratch our heads and pray, no matter what it, people are being accused of, let it be proven in court and not in the media. Lord, I pray for the martyred. I pray for their families who must live on alone, and I pray for those that are in prison. And Lord, I want to pray for the two prisons we have in this area. I want to pray for Freedom Life and Danny and all that they're doing for the community. I want to lift up those two young men that have been working up with me and just ask that you would continue to strengthen them and guide them. We love you, Lord. We love that we can trust you with all of the needs of the people we care about. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, tonight we're talking about facing favoritism in the church. Life can be pretty messy. I mean, it can be complicated, full of problems. We have big ones, we have small ones. We're not quite sure how to solve them or even where to go to answers for some of them. And there's no shortage of people handing out advice. I mean, whether you watch, uh, I understand Steve Harvey's a new judge on TV. Don't know it, haven't seen it, but that seems like an interesting thing. I don't know where he got his law degree. But whether it's Friends or your mom or Siri or Google or Dr. Phil or Oprah, you know, there's a ton of talk shows. There's places to get advice. But tonight I want to talk about the advice from our friend James. Jimmy. Jesus is little brother. He wrote a book, self-titled it. He offered it up with some wisdom on everyday problems, how to deal with anger, how to deal with managing your mouth, cleaning up relational messes. Uh, we guarantee it's better advice than you'll get from any TV program. And tonight, I want to take us to gym class. As we journey into the book of James, we'll be in chapter two. One, actually, we begin, we're in the first two chapters. We're gonna be at 127, that's where we're gonna start. I'm glad you're here instead of some other options that you have. This Wednesday night crowd is always so faithful and coming. <coughs> this amazing book written by Jesus' little brother has more practical information and insights than almost any other New Testament book. It doesn't deal with theology at all as much as it does with the application of obedience to the Bible. We're looking at the great inversion tonight. The inversion that was created by Christ with this new society that he started, where the people who thought of as being weak are becoming strong through spiritual life, and the people who the human social environment thought were good people and wise people, particularly when it comes to career and money and fame or recognition, the successful, the strong, the Bible views those people altogether different. <laughs> Do you remember the show, The Fiddler on the Roof? Um, Tevye was the milk farmer. Um, he was a milkman that delivered milk, if you remember the musical. And there's a song in that musical. And uh, you want me to sing it for you? I'm not going to. Um, but he sings this song, and you may know it. It's called, If I Were a Rich Man. If I were a rich man, the most important men in town would come to fawn on me. They would ask me to advise them, like Solomon the Wise, posing problems that would cross a rabbit's eyes. And it won't make one bit of difference if I answer right or wrong. When you're rich, they think you really know. And that's how life was. We still think that way. We still think that if you have money and you've been successful, if you've got an education, if you drive the right car, or wear the right clothes, or live in the right community, <coughs> you must be smarter than the people that don't. And that gets layered inside and outside the church. We have a tendency in the church to do the same thing. I was so involved in outreach at the church that I used to be at is when we would start our second service. The first service was almost always members. The second service was a lot more guests. 
And I would look out and I would see cars that obviously were not our members' cars because our members drove new cars. And I would sit in the back of the church where I could field anything that was going on. And I would get at the end of every service the 10 or 12 visitor cards that we would get. But I would watch who turned in visitor cards and where they sat. At the end of every service, they were all invited to join us in the hospitality room where we could meet them and give them a gift and talk to them. And many of them were financially beneath the church we were at. But we did everything we could to make them feel at home. Well, let me start in James 127. It says, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. To visit the orphans and widows in their trouble. And to keep oneself unspotted from the world. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Let's pray. Father, I just pray this would have an impact tonight. <clears throat> that would allow us to take a look and a listen to your Holy Spirit and your word. Guide us through these times in your name. Amen. James is warning people to beware of personal favoritism. He's saying there's a... Let me just share with you what goes on in here, because there's a tremendous history in Rome about this. James was writing to, and it will help us to understand this, the background. Bear with me, because it's going to take a few minutes to get through this. Um, there was a scholar named Dr. Hellerman who wrote a lot about the Roman Empire, and at that time, he said, what life was like, there was a huge divide between the wealthy and the regular population. Now, we didn't have that in the 50s and 60s. In the 50s and 60s, we had the fastest growing middle class in the world. In fact, if you went almost anywhere in the world besides America, you had the ruling class and you had the working class, but you didn't have the middle class. Most people didn't go to universities around the world. They didn't have the kind of money that they had. In Rome, 2% of the population in Rome were called the elite, just 2%. They had the wealth, the power, they had the privilege. Rome was very much in pursuit of honor and status. Serio, an orator and a senator under the reign of Julius Caesar once wrote, rank in Rome must be preserved above all else. Rank and status was the bond that held everything together. You had to know and recognize your place in society. So there'd be a few different levels or statuses, like rungs on a ladder in the ancient Roman Empire, and at the very top were the senators. Rome had a senate in the imperial days. There were 600 senators. They had the wealth, and they were at the top of the list. Underneath those folks were the equestrians. They were called that because in the early days, to have a vehicle or a horse put you in one of the higher listings. You were an equestrian. There were several thousands of them. Underneath them was the decurions. They held a lower level office. All of these were part of the top 2% of the population. The senators, the equestrians, and the decurions. They ran everything. Beneath them, 98% were called the vulgus. We get our word vulgar from them. They were the dirty servants and slaves and common people that flooded the Colosseums and flooded the streets. <coughs> Some of them had their freedom. Some of them were free people, but most of them were servants or slaves. In those days, if a servant was being treated well by the person that bought him, <coughs> if the person that bought him decided to redeem him or let him go, if he wanted to stay in that household, he would go to the front door and they would take an awl and they would drive it through his ear or her ear, making a hole there so that people would know that they were free but committed to a household. So no one would steal them to sell them on the 
slave block. <laughs> One ancient writer had an, in an interesting observation about this. He said, the existence of inferiors is good for superiors, for it enables them to point out those that they're superior over. If I'm at the top of the ladder, I like having people beneath me because it makes me feel good about myself and the status that I've earned. Now, you won't see a statement like that in the New Testament anywhere. You won't see it today either because it was central to the ancient world, but not necessarily to America. That's because the idea that came from Israel via Jesus to the world was something that never existed before, that all people are equal. Nobody ever said that. It was never said. And Jesus and his communications in time, it, it won the world. In theory, if not in practice. Here's another observation about ancient uh, arrangements. The social chasm between the poor, the non-elite, and the rich, the elite, is different as much as an ant to a camel. And if you're an ant, you're never going to be a camel and if you're a camel, you're never going to be an ant. And in those days, there was no, may, no way to make that difference, no way to change the society. Um, by the way, that's still very, very true under Hindu India. We had a president in India that was very open to Christianity because it, it brought so much service and dignity to the people of India. <coughs> but they got rid of him and put in a strict Hindu who's been shutting down orphanages and Christian schools everywhere and making all of the children, loading them five, 6,000 at a time in buses and taking them into cities of millions and millions and turning them loose on the streets to beg. Rather than being in the safe environment where they wore clothing and they were fed and they were being educated. Because the Hindus said they were poor people. They were the bottom of the line. They shouldn't have been taken off the streets. They shouldn't have been taken out of their villages. They were meant to be the bottom of the caste system. They were meant to be the plebes, the vulgars. They were meant to be that. And God intended them to be that. And to take them out and educate them and tell them that they were equal to all other people is a violation of Hindu belief system and religion. In the ancient world, there was something that you could wear to show your status. The toga. See, if you were a Ducurian, you could wear a toga. Everybody would know if you were walking through the streets that you were one of those uppity folks. Because you wore a toga. By the way, you had to be a citizen of Rome to wear a toga. The basic toga was called a toga virilis. See, we get our vir oh, we get our word vi viral from it. Excuse me, viral. We get our word viral from it. If you could wear a, a toga, you were viral. By the way, women women were not allowed to wear togas. It didn't matter what status you were. No togas for women. That's another thing that we get from Jesus: equality of women. Now, if you were a senator, you didn't just wear a toga. You got a purple stripe on it. Everybody knew who the senators were because only they had the purple stripe on their toga. And if you were an equestrian, you were allowed to wear a gold ring. Those were obvious outward signs of the status of those people. Today, it's the housing that we have or the cars that we drive or things like that. In fact... They called the equestrians, they called them the people of the gold ring. Another thing that was really common in those days was seating. If you came into some place to sit down, all of the well-to-do, all of the togas, purples and golds, and all the togas sat in the front. If people were there, <laughs> they would sit in the upper seats if they were even allowed in. Nowadays, we know that as those people that buy the seats that are up front. So <laughs> I used to take my sons to the Hornets game in uh, Charlotte. We, we needed opera glasses. We were in the nosebleeds. But we would come in early enough that the basketball players would be practicing and my kids would be down front watching it. 
And the women that get and serve drinks to the wealthy that own those box seats would say to my sons, um, the tailors won't be here tonight, so if you want to sit here, you can sit here for the game. And I go to sit down. She said, no, sir, there's only two seats. You'll have to go to your seat. And so I'd watch my boys down front watching the game. Wasn't that awesome, Dad? I said, oh, yeah, yeah, my eyes are killing me from up here. Because they had togas, and I did. They were young. And we still do that, by the way, except in church. In church, we like the back roads. And I, I'm not sure all about that. Maybe I should get David a toga. I'm not sure. You, you know, the front rows are available. Now, do you know in those days, <laughs> there was a trial that was going on in Rome, and there was a guy that was being charged, and a, a senator who didn't even know the guy, or what the, he didn't know what the guy was being charged with, walked into the court and said, I know this guy, and he's disrespectful, found, find him guilty. Didn't even know what the charge was, they found him guilty, and he was sold into a mining camp for the rest of his life. Well, the word of a senator that walked into a courtroom. Now, of course, that wouldn't happen in America where someone could make an accusation that was false, but there was an awful lot of that going on. You know what the worst, the absolute worst thing that could happen to a common person? It was the lowest form of death, the crucifixion. It was reserved for the lowest of lowest people. It was first designed by the Persians Perfected by the Romans. It was designed. They were hung naked for days sometimes. So everybody could see that they were no accounts. Now. One day into the great Roman Empire emerges this very strange little community being led by Jesus. The guy who revered common people more than he did rabbis and Pharisees in their fancy outfits. The one they fouled and the one they admired, he was a crucified guy. And he introduced a great inversion, something that was new in society, a, a change of everything. One day, a crucified guy's brother wrote this book. And, he, and if you think this book is nothing but some practical things, you're, you're missing some of the reality of it. In James 2, he says, uh, what we read, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Don't, don't show favoritism. This is not what Jesus designed. Not in this community. Not in the one my brother died for. He was crucified for. Why not? Because God doesn't have favorites. That's why. God didn't love one thief on the cross more than another. God doesn't love one sinner more or less than another. Equality from God. This is so revolutionary that nobody knew how to think about it. Nobody was sure what to do. The rabbis and the Pharisees hated Jesus because they loved their status as leaders. They loved their silken robes and the best seats. When he changed that, he was changing the world. Nobody thought about that. Nobody realized what was going to happen in the next 300 years. <laughs> Jesus, when our people wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all human beings are created equal. <laughs> our finding fathers didn't get that out of their own thoughts. They took that out of the Bible. That was not self-evident to Caesar or anybody else that was ruling. <coughs> Peter's telling us when he learns about this in the book of Acts, he says, <coughs> in Acts 10, 34, then Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth I perceive that God shows no partiality. There is no favoritism with God. Paul writes to the believers in Ephesus, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Ephesus 6, 9, and you masters do the same thing to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. You slave owners, 
you're a slave to Jesus, and he shows you no partiality, you're going to heaven. You better quit threatening those other people and treat them like Christians. To Colossae, he writes, but he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done wrong, for there is no partiality. This isn't a casual word in the New Testament. Peter, James, Paul, no favoritism. Don't get caught doing it. Don't be that way. There's no favoritism with God. James 2, 2 through 4. It's going to really push people's buttons. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring. Suppose an equestrian comes in. He's got the gold ring on. You guys all know this is Toga Gold Ring Guy. And... brightly shining garments. And the poor man in filthy clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the, the man wearing fine clothes, and of course they will, and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand back there. Or, or sit on the floor over here. Because they've been trained to do that. He says in verse 4, if you do that, haven't you revealed your prejudice, segregated the community, and become judges with evil thoughts? James says, I'll tell you a story. Imagine two guys come into a church. There's one of them wearing a gold and a toga, and the other one's just a bum. He's a struggling guy, one set of clothes. He smells like he's been picking onions and hanging out with sheep. Where's, where are you going to sit him? Because if you sit them according to their status in the world, you have violated what God is doing. Jesus is saying there is no status. There's no favoritism in the church. We shouldn't have that. James, James Bond says, no gold finger in this place. We're not having it. Today, we just say, you know, what school did they go to? Graduate of Stanford, Harvard, whatever it is. But James is saying, my crucified brother, who rose from the dead, died the lowest death there is, marked as the lowest person in the Roman society, when they unjustly killed him on a cross, he says, no longer will that be tolerated in the new society he's creating. No more favoritism. James goes on to say, listen, my dear brothers, in James 2, 5 through 6, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world? Anybody poorer than Mary and Joseph and Jesus born in a Shed to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who loved him. But you have dishonored the poor. It is not the rich who are dragging you into court. James is really making a point of this. This is really big back then. The favoritism that existed in that new church. And we're going to act like it doesn't happen. Do you know this is the most segregated place in America on Sunday mornings is church. When I was studying to do church building, one of the things they showed us was a graph. And on that graph, they had three bars at the top, three bars below, three bars below, and three bars below. At the bottom, they had lower class off to the side. And they had higher lower class, middle lower class, and lower lower class. And then they had a bar that said middle class. And it was upper middle class, middle middle class, and lower middle class. And then they had upper class. And we had upper upper class, upper middle class, upper lower class. And then they had elite. And the same three statuses. They said when you go to build a church, <coughs> you will only be able to build the church one bar up or one bar down. So if, you, if you're in an area where the people are upper middle class, you will attract lower upper class and middle middle class, but you can't attract people below that or above that. 
because we live in a world where status and economics dominates people's thinking. And even though they don't think it makes a difference, it makes a difference. You could be at work with a poor person and you don't think I'm going to invite them to church. They'll embarrass me. He's always got that beer breath and he always smells like cigars or whatever it is, but we have a tendency to birds of a feather flock together. Dallas Willard, I read a lot of his. He was a seminary professor in Dallas and he wrote, and when he's talking about the great inversion, the reversal of everything that existed in Rome and in all cultures, Egypt, everywhere back then, God now is turning everything upside down. This transcends all human arrangements, all cultures, all politics, everything. It's way bigger than any of that. The great inversion involves this thought among others. Now Christ, in Christ, there are none in the humanly down position. None so low that they cannot be lifted up by entering into God's forgiveness and joining the ranks of the born again. And there are none in the humanly high positions that cannot be brought down from society if they'll humble themselves before God, seeking forgiveness like every other fallen human being. Of course, it doesn't mean that every poor person has come to Christ, but <coughs> it does mean that if you're rich, <coughs> it might be a little harder. See, God loves everybody. The thing about poverty is it tends to make people <coughs> see their needs. They see their need for God. They see their need much greater than wealthy people do. Riches tend to make people blind, blind to their needs because they can get everything they need or want, eat out whenever they want, pick up a new car when the other one starts to make funny sounds. They just... So wealth, which humanly speaking, makes you think you're secure and strong. You are not very secure and strong in Christ if you're wealthy. In fact, the most dangerous position to be in is to be rich right now. To be lost and rich in America means it's really going to be hard to find Christ. You can find a church. We got churches that just love the wealthy. They don't talk about sin. They don't talk about conversion. They got lots of ways of doing good and earning your right and patting them on the back. And one of the biggest is a Catholic church, but they will accept anybody at every status. You know the great inversion, blessed are the poor, and blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek. Why is Jesus naming us? We didn't own a car for most of my life. My dad had a work truck. We took the bus everywhere in the city. We walked to school. All the other kids, they were wearing madras shirts from India. It was the big thing then, man. They were wearing... All kinds, they saddle shoes and these different things that were going on. Do you remember when they ran around tearing the loops off the back of shirts and stuff in school? See, a couple of you nod and remember that. I couldn't afford any of those. I bought the shirts in the Salvation Army with the loops ripped off. James, 1, 8 through 11. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation. Because as a flower of the field he will pass away, for no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass, its flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Believers from humble circumstance focus on how high they have been raised by Christ in their new position. Debbie and I and Jan were sitting on our back porch the other day and just being amazed at how far God has brought us. From when we got in the car and we would pray that it would turn over and start. You've had them, I think, where you put the key in and you go to turn it on and it doesn't work right, so you turn it back and you pull the key out. And you shake the key like that's going to do something. Put it back in there and do it again. And the third time it goes, 
In those days, there was no fuel injection, so you'd, you'd, you'd have hit that thing to start that choke. And it start up. Praise Jesus, we're going to make it to church. But the rich should take pride in their humiliation. Focus on you've been allowed to inherit life eternal in Christ by surrendering your past position for a new one. Humbling yourself before God and saying, I relinquish the wealth you've given me and the riches you've given me. I will not find my identity in those things anymore. I'm going to find them in you. Mark Fambrini was a rich kid. I didn't know him very well. Debbie hung out with that crowd because she was in college. My friends were all drug dealers and felons or at least misdemeanors. And Mark's parents were partial owners of Vikings cruise lines. And Mark decided he didn't want to get drafted when his number came up, so his parents sent him to a university in Mexico. Now, I didn't know when all that happened, but I knew when he came back from Mexico. They weren't sending people to Vietnam anymore. They were about to stop the draft, and he came back. And we got into an argument one day while smoking a joint or something. And <clears throat> he said, you know, I feel sorry for you. He said, you've always been poor. So you're jealous of my family's wealth. But I've always been wealthy. And I know that money means nothing. I won't spend my life chasing money, but you will chase in mine. You'll spend your life chasing money because you think that's the answer. Less than a year later, I met Jesus. And I realized Mark was right. I'd have done anything for money. Lied, stolen. I'd have done anything to get more money. Until I met Jesus. And he didn't care that I was poor. He didn't care that everything I owned was stuffed into a backpack. He didn't care that I never finished high school. He didn't care that I didn't have any clothes with fancy names on them. That my sandals I bought in Mexico with the tires on the bottom. He didn't care about any of that. He only cared that I was willing to humble myself and be broken enough to cry out and say, help me, God. See, we have a problem in, in our society. We call it the reticular activating system. It's what happens naturally to us when you see something. For instance, let's say, like John and Francis, you buy a Volkswagen bug. All of a sudden, you notice Volkswagen bugs everywhere. Maybe you buy a Mustang. You didn't even notice how many were out there until you get a Mustang. Like John, he's got a Mustang fender. And you notice them everywhere. It's a dog. You get yourself a, a German Shepherd, a Russian Wolfhound, all of a sudden you see them. That's part of the reticular activating system that is part of us. Well, sin has gotten into our reactivity activity center, our reticular activity center. Sin has built it up. And we get attracted to these certain things. And it affects the way we do church. Well, God did something like that. One day God said, if I was a poor man, he came down to earth to a poor couple. And he stayed a poor man his whole life. And he had a heart and a love for the poor. He never saw them as beneath him. James 2.14-17 If you're there you can look. What does it profit my brethren if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister are naked and destitute of daily food and 
One of you says to them, depart in peace, be, be warmed and filled, but you don't, you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, it does not have works, it is dead. <coughs> if everything you do is in your own geography, if everything you do is about your own property, if your needs and cares for those that you see. A guy came off the freeway today, right up here, at the, by the family dollar and all that right there. And I had already driven by him. I grabbed a bottle of water from the house. I had it there so I'd have some water today. <coughs> and there was a line of cars behind me as I come in here and I was so bummed. So I spun around and I drove back to give that guy a bottle of water. And I couldn't find him by the time I got down back there to him. And I remembered all the times I hitchhiked cross country. All the times I felt so abandoned, so alone. Sleeping in the back seat of cars at gas stations where the windows had been broken out and it was cold. Sleeping under underpasses waking up with my feet covered in snow. I mean poor. So when I see them, wherever they are and whatever they're doing, I'm trying to have granola bars and water, and I just want to tell them, hey, you matter to God. God doesn't see you as a problem. He knows that you have a problem and he's the solution. I got something. I give him the water. I love to give him the John, the little book I got a bunch of here for here. <coughs> I read this, it changed my life. If you got time, you ought to read it. It might change your life. You might discover there's a God and he loves you. There are those beliefs I claim to believe, but I really don't. My body and my life doesn't really revolve around those beliefs. We all know about those. I mean, they're the things I try to convince myself or you that are true, even though I don't necessarily believe them. Religious leaders do too much of that. Hypocrites do that. Politicians do that. Parents do that. <coughs> Remember that old saying? Don't do what I say, do what I tell you. Then there are things that I think I believe, but it turns out I actually don't. I mean, I may think that Jesus loves the poor. I may think, I may believe that. I may believe Jesus loves the poor, but I don't do anything about it. I believe, I, I believe that God loves those prisoners that are getting out of the prison, but I don't do anything about it. Before COVID, I never missed a Wednesday night at Freedom Life. That was the day the new guys were getting out of prison. There'd be four or five new guys there, fresh out of prison. Baby Christians trying to figure out how to get their footing. Oh, I used to love Danny Hampton and what he would say to them and how he tried to encourage them. I'd come early so I could sit out front and talk to him. be sitting on a bench, most of them smoked, and we'd be talking out there. How long have you been out? Got out this afternoon. What you gonna do? One day at a time. Man, do I ever remember those early days. One day at a time. Of course, I haven't been going. I've been here Wednesday nights, but I'll probably start to go again. Why? Because I believe that. I, I believe it with my actions and with my works about the poor, about the prisoners, about where God does his most business. The third level is what I really believe. That's what we call our mental map. 
I have a mental map of how my life and my day should go. That's the things I believe in and, and I structure my life about them and I, I believe neglecting them reflects that something's broken in me if I'm not doing it, if I'm not showing it, if I'm not reflecting it. Whether we want to admit it or not, we live at the mercy of our mental maps. You obey your mental map. The Holy Spirit of God comes into our life and it says, me, the Holy Spirit, and this, oops, me and the Holy Spirit, this book and the Holy Spirit, we will reprogram your mental map. You can't do it. You can't choose a behavior modification program and alter yourself. But you can let the word of God and the very spirit of God reprogram your mental map. And you can let other people become more important than your security. You can let the needy be more important than your next new car. I've been working on a sermon for Does God Still Heal? I get the newsletter from the name on this, William Hughes, 17 year old that bought this for me back before I even got married. He's been a missionary in Thailand for 42, 44 years. And his newsletter talks about how they go into a place in Thailand where the head witch doctor, the head honcho, the Hindu leader, or the Muslim leader, they try to find someone in their family who's ill, sick, cancer ridden. And they go in and they testify about Jesus. And then they pray over them. And God is still doing miraculous healings. And the word spreads through town and they all gather together. And he preaches about the God who heals. Do you know in the Old Testament the word shalom? And when, when, when they talk, when the Jews talk about salvation, they always talk about the healing of Israel. The healing of the land. There is no salvation without healing. When we think of salvation, it's the healing of my soul. It's the redemption, the renewing, the brand new heart that heals me. And I love to read the stories about how God, like the first century church, he had to do all those miracles to validate that Jesus was Jesus. And he had to do all those miracles to validate that those apostles were indeed with Jesus to launch the new church. And over there in Thailand, launching a new church in areas that don't know Jesus, have, they don't have the word of God, they don't know about any of that kind of stuff, and most of them can't read and write. God is still healing. And I get his newsletter and I read it, and the other day I told Debbie after I finished reading, I said, cut him another check. Don't make it to the ministry, make it to Bill and his wife that they might get away, they might get something that they need. He's got another year in the jungles. Everywhere he goes, he's in threat of his life, but he's still out there. Pray, God, do whatever you have to do to these poor souls that don't know you. Help me to find the most destitute. Holy Spirit, do your miracles and transform them that we might rock this village. And the pictures that he sends, they're always sitting on dirt or logs or they're under thatched roofs. And I'm thinking... Couldn't live like that. Lord, what's wrong with me? I couldn't live like that. Serving the poor and the destitute. See, I say that I could, but that's one of those things I think I believe, but I don't. I was one of those people that said, God said, we're looking for missionaries. And I thought, oh, good, take my sister. I didn't want to go. But I do know what I do believe. I believe we need to face favoritism 
in our lives and in our church that we do what Jesus did. No gold rings, no purple stripes. Togas don't mean nothing. The car you drive, you show up here, you're welcome. Grace is on tap. Invite your friends that don't look so good. Invite those people you run into. Get a car wash, invite the person at the car wash. For heaven's sakes, you know how much quicker they'll accept Christ from the bottom than the people that you know and hang out with at the top? come to the end of my last Wednesday night. And like is often the case, you're so attentive. I don't know if I startle you or scare you or you just like my voice. But either way, your being here, your attentiveness, it's always been a tremendous amount of respect that I've enjoyed. So thank each one of you. I, from the bottom of my heart, thank you that the long ride down and the long day here on Wednesdays always ends up being worthwhile because some of you actually know how to smile. So, despite your husband, thank you, Francis, for smiling. And John, as I close out here, I want you to know something. I am so grateful that you were the head deacon when I came here. I appreciate how much you went out of your way to negotiate, help me negotiate the things I needed to learn and I needed to know. And all of the duties you kept laying on me I didn't know about. The prayer letter, the newsletter, the bulletin, the Sunday night. I, there's just a whole raft of things John introduced me to that I didn't know. I learned to enjoy every little bit of it. Father, we just close off now and thank you. Thank you that there is a place that we could come, that we could lift names to you and we could look at your book and we could talk about the remarkable truths. Thank you for living in a society governed by the one that was crucified, a society of faith and belief that's inverted where it isn't status here. It's redemption. Be with us as we go. In Jesus' precious name, amen.